Um, looking at the notoriety, quality and um, talent of the next speakers on this panel, one could assume that the collision between public relations and the law is going to be very interesting, bearing in mind the kind of cases and issues they've been dealing with in recent times. Um, I look forward to what I'm sure you'll agree will be a very, very interesting session. I've asked um, that Will Horton QC um, be the moderator of this session and uh, try and control the speakers. Um, please welcome our speakers and please welcome Will Horton at QC. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Will. Um, I'm going to introduce the four speakers in turn and then ask them to speak. And hopefully we will have time for some questions from the floor um, afterwards. So if there are areas of interest, which I'm sure there will be, that occur to you, please save your questions till the end. Now, we've got four distinguished speakers for our final session. Um, the first one is Mr Leon Zwar, who is a senior partner at Adelbrock Liebler. Now, for many years, Leon has been a preeminent commercial litigation practitioner and as an insolvency practitioner, he is without peer. I could say a lot more about Leon, but he asked me yesterday that less was best, and I respect that. The second speaker today is Mr Tony Hargraves, who is the principal of the firm Tony Hargraves and Partners. Tony is a very experienced criminal solicitor. He's been in practice for over 30 years. And um, for the last 25 years, approximately, if any Victorian police officers have been charged with criminal offences, it's been Tony and his firm who have defended them. That's a lot of cases. Tony, uh, last year, acted for the Essendon Football Club in its um, difficulties with ASADA and the AFL Commission. This year, he has been acting for 32 of the 34 past and present Essendon players involved in that particular matter. Our third speaker today is Mr Robert Richter, QC. Um, he is very well known to all of you, I'm sure. Um, he is a leading criminal advocate in this state and in this country. Um, he has achieved a near legendary status amongst the profession, who affectionately refer to him as the Red Baron. Um, anyone who has had the skills to obtain an acquittal for Mr Mick Gatto on a murder charge um, must deserve that almost legendary status. Um, he's not only a very fine trial advocate, <coughs> I once saw him in the High Court one cold Friday morning on a special leave application when he put a most persuasive argument on behalf of his client um, to a special leave bench. I was certainly persuaded, would have granted him special leave and heard the appeal in Stanter and he would have succeeded. Uh, the High Court took a different view, he lost. Now, our f final speaker, fourth and final speaker, is Mr Julian Burnside, AOQC. Um, Julian uh, is a very fine commercial silk, as is well known, but he's probably better well known these days in his role as a public law advocate in the area of human rights and refugee advocacy. Uh, Julian is an experienced and polished performer in the media. I won't rehearse the many appearances he's done in the media. I simply recall a comment that his instructing solicitor made uh, when he, uh, after Mr Burnside had appeared for James Heard in the AFL Commission. His instructing solicitor told ABC's 7.30 report um, after the case that the AFL Commission uh, looked to behave like a bunch of cashed up bogans who thought they could do what they wanted. Now, that seems to me to be classic public relations skills that Julian would never be guilty of. So on that note, perhaps I could call upon Leon to commence our discussion. Well, we'll, we'll have to use the podium. We can't use them. Okay. Um, sorry, Leon, I think you might have to go up to the podium oh, is that right? so that we can all hear you. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction. <clears throat> I'm going to briefly discuss three matters. First, 
I'm going to make some comments about the direction my colleagues will take in their presentations. Second, why all lawyers, judges, barristers and solicitors must play a greater role in framing legal issues in the media. And I will touch on differing matters like the takeover of Patrick, the Richard Pratt ACCC criminal prosecution and the allegations recently made against the Leader of the Opposition. I'll share a few war stories about them. Thirdly, I will share with you my observations about legal media management, which, is, which I think is different from the common approach which has been taken. And um, I'm counting on our convener to caution me as I approach time. Okay. The preparation for this joint presentation commenced with Tony Hargrave saying we should each do short presentations rather than move quickly to questions because Robert Richter will get asked one question and will then talk for an hour. Robert replied with an email telling us all he was cruising on a yacht and I would go first and tell a few war stories and then others would follow with observations and anecdotes. Later, Tony sought confirmation we would not be discussing Essendon as he represents most of the players. I told him the only reason you are holding back is because of the prospect that he'd do so. And as for Julian, we didn't hear from him until this morning. I should have left a message that was Tony Jones from hashtag Quanda, and I may have heard back. Please take that as a comment. The other speakers will discuss, amongst other things, the role of public relations spin masters in legal controversies. I challenge the traditional view that there should be little or no interaction between lawyers and media in big litigation or significant commercial transactions. In my experience, public relations and media advocacy are best understood as just another form of advocacy which we need to undertake on behalf of our clients and which judges also need to consider in their hearings and delivery of judgments. In the information age, media pervades our society, so we need to adapt as lawyers and modernise our approach. The media will report on large matters. The legal issues need to be carefully and properly framed and the media shapes the outcome of court cases. I have absolutely no doubt about that. Media affects the reputations of large corporations and their senior officers. If we act for them as their lawyers, they need us to advocate for them in the media. The media affects regulators. Lawyers do need to be careful to consider when and how to assist clients in the media, and it's not every case, but it requires careful consideration. Take, for example, the bitterly contested takeover of Patrick by Toll. There was no competitive bidder for Patrick. Once Toll announced the bid, Patrick was clearly in play. However, the consideration for Patrick's shareholders increased from the initial offer that Toll made by $1.5 billion without any competition. How? Let me explain. The competitive tension emanated from a series of Supreme Court proceedings brought by Patrick challenging the efficacy of the Toll bid. Those proceedings raised difficult and complex legal issues, but they created, they created doubt about the transaction. The media reported on the court cases. The media reporting created the doubt in the marketplace. In the result, Toll was forced to increase the offer price to buy support, notwithstanding that there was no other bidder and its initial offer was a, the, above the price Patrick had then been trading at. It was the interaction of media and the law that led to Patrick's shareholders getting a, an advantage, an extra one and a half billion dollars. Media played a key role in it and we had a role, obviously, as lawyers in assisting in that process. Let, let me share two other observations about that matter. First, the Patrick chair, after it was all over, told me that given how little we actually achieved in court, it was incredible how the media had reported it. I thanked him profusely for sharing that observation. And, and secondly, and this still grates on me, the investment bank bankers' success fees went through the roof, while all the lawyers, of course, uh, recovered our fixed hourly rate. We need to revisit that, but now is not the time. Let me share with you some observation about Richard Pratt's ACCC prosecution. 
I hope these observations will further demonstrate the need for lawyers to advocate for their clients in public relations fora. In 2008, Richard Pratt's Visi Group settled ACCC civil proceedings and paid a penalty of $36 million. The ACCC and Pratt entered into an agreed statement of facts in which concessions were made by Pratt solely for that preceding and with an express obligation that the ACCC would not use it for any other purpose. The ACCC used it to commence a perjury proceeding against Pratt. It was one of the more unpleasant meetings with a client telling him he'd be charged after that settlement. Pratt, like all billionaires, cared greatly about his reputation and was screaming about the injustice done to him by Graham Samuel personally in the ACCC. And he wanted the sense of injustice captured in the media. Pratt wanted a very aggressive framing of the legal issues in the media. Rather than the stock standard denial of wrongdoing, and we will vigorously defend this proceeding, which is, which is the common answer when, when a party is sued, we came out on day one and said publicly that Pratt would apply the blowtorch to Graham Samuel's ACCC. The media reacted to the framing of the legal issues in that way and understood that the defence was going to prosecute the prosecution. It had been done before. Kerry Packer had done it a long time ago in relation to the Goanna matter. The ACCC never recovered from that perception that the criminal prosecution was wrong. I should at this time refer to the role of the judiciary in, in key judgments. Pratt applied for preliminary relief concerning the admissibility of the agreed statement of facts before Justice Ryan. We formulated questions about admissibility generally and in the alternative, whether the court should exclude the agreed statement of facts on any of, other, in, in any of the other six discretionary grounds. By the time the judgment was to be delivered, Pratt was dying. He was critically ill. At the time, he was then Australia's wealthiest citizen. The media were in a frenzy about this case as we pushed to clear his name on legal grounds before his death. He did not want to be and was not relieved of that, the criminal prosecution because of ill health, notwithstanding the spin of the DPP. And yes, it mattered to him. He wanted to, deny, he wanted to die knowing the matter was behind him. Justice Ryan came into a packed court to deliver his judgment. And, and I make no criticism at all of him in, in what I'm now about to relay to you. Because what he did was in accord with common practice. He began this judgment with his packed court and he said, in answer to question one, no. 2A, unnecessary to answer. 2B, unnecessary to answer. 2C, unnecessary to answer. At which point I turned around to my clients at Pratt Group and gave them in the best traditions of the castle the double thumbs up, at which point everyone knew the result and ran out of the court to go to live media. Um, I believe that the judiciary needs to be more sensitive in such matters to informally explain the outcome to the audience without compromising on the black letter of the law, and I think we, are, we have moved some way in that direction but can go further. Let me give you another example of the need for lawyers to advocate a different type of high-profile problem. Late last year, on the day that Bill Shorten was appointed leader of the opposition, a claim was made against him about a sexual assault alleged to have occurred in 1986, about 30 years ago. The claim was initially posted on Kevin Rudd's Facebook page, beginning, Dearest Kevin. The matter was fully investigated by the police and Bill Shorten was cleared. On 21 August of this year, Bill Shorten made a public statement about it. I want to share with you some observations about that statement, which also reflect on why we have a role to play in such matters. One, if you ever look or listen to that statement, you'll notice there are no words of qualification. He directly confronts the serious issues. There is no spin. Two, as you would expect, the statement never repeats the untrue allegation made against him. Not once. It's never there. Best practice is not to repeat such things. Three, Bill Shorten dealt with the allegation by saying the person was someone he briefly knew, and there is absolutely no basis for the claim. Four, Bill remarkably and generously acknowledged the integrity and decency of his politi political opponents. 
And finally, preempting the future as a good statement ought, he said it's over and he has steadfastly maintained that position. That statement was well received by the media, the public, and even Bill's political opponents. Malcolm Turnbull was prescient and made the observation that Bill Shorten had mimicked the approach he had advised Kerry Packer to take many years earlier when he was Kerry's lawyer, and it did. My last observation about that matter is this. The usual spin doctors will always advocate never to lead a bad media story. Lawyers as advocates will often have a different perspective and clients need us to give it. I want to briefly touch upon media technique. I was educated by an article clerk who came to the law later in his career after a stellar career as a journalist. Later went on to become the Privacy Commissioner for the State of Victoria. And this is what he taught me about how to manage legal issues in the media. When dealing with journalists, acknowledge their professionalism and disclose that you'll put your trust in it. It is also a way to take control, but there is ill will between the professions. Journalists assume that lawyers talk down to them by acknowledging their profession, they respect you for it, and, earn, and, and you earn their respect. Two, define the basis of your discussions very early on, off the record, on the record, backgrounding. And make it clear that if you're going to make a statement on the record, you wish to check it before the journalist uses it. Three, explain how you're going to interact with them so that I will always say to them, I'm going to tell you an objective truth. We are before Justice Beach on the 12th of October in the federal court. That's an objective truth and, and that's what it is. Secondly, I will never lie to them. And, I, and I, I make it absolutely plain, I will never lie to a journalist and I don't. And the journalists get it. I mean, sometimes they'll raise with me things that I'm very uncomfortable to talk about and I'm quite honest about it. And sometimes I might even crack a joke and say, not really a great point for us, and they will laugh at the candour and the honesty and often give you a better run about it than not. I also define when I'm advocating. So they, are, they understand from, from media that there's a lot of spinning. But, but if you make it clear to them that you are advocating, that is, you're arguing, you're arguing a point, they respect you for it. Finally, if a written statement is sought from a client, always turn your mind to the news cycle and timing, and always revert within time, even if it's to explain that you won't provide a statement. Their dealings with our profession are such that most lawyers never get back to them, which is they talk down to them and, dis and disrespectfully, and, and it shows in the way they will report a problem. My experiences with the media have generally been positive. My partners think it has more to do with not wishing to burn me as a future source, and less to do with the principles I've just announced. I'm not so cynical. Let me share with you one last story about legal public relations management in a different context, sport. Many years ago, I reorganised Soccer in Australia with Frank Lowy. We, we, we effectively completed an informal winding up of Soccer Australia and established the new Football Federation of Australia. It was supported, of course, by the government injecting fresh funds, FIFA treating the old entity as having no worth and moving the, the licence to the new entity. And Frank had to make this huge announcement in front of a, a massive media throng about it. And just before he went out, he said, what do I say to the media when they ask me, why did we get rid of the old Soccer Australia entity? And you'll understand the advice I gave him. I said, Frank, what you need to say to the media is, it's nearing, it was nearing insolvency, nearing insolvency. And his media guy said, Frank will never get it. Um, he went straight out. And the first question that he was asked was, why did you get rid of the old Soccer Australia entity, Frank? And he said, because it was broke, completely broke. <laughs> um, I end by acknowledging that in all these pro profile matters I've mentioned, and many others, the bar has played a huge role in assisting me. The bar is my check and balance. I regard it as fundamental risk management, to consult on these highly unusual and difficult matters and to work closely with the bar to develop the media strategies because it, the, the big matters cut across so many areas of the law, defamation, crime, 
director's duties, regulatory work, transactions, truth in takeovers. And so, um, as a lawyer, I, I say that these things could not be done with this, without the assistance of that check and balance. I'm now going to ask Tony to um, take over. <laughs> It would seem that Leon Zwire and I live in very different worlds. I don't catch planes overseas with Frank Lowy. I act for police officers and priests generally. They don't have the same kind of luxuries that Leon's clients have. In my experience, the use of public relations consultants or crisis management experts, as they're often called, is expensive and generally produces no discernible benefit to the litigation or the charges that have been issued and can, even on occasions, be counterproductive. My attitude may be considered old-fashioned, and conservative, but I don't believe in running my court cases in the media, and I don't think generally that it's in my client's interests to generate publicity about them. In criminal law, which is the area I generally practice in, the fundamental problem is that crisis management experts want to generate publicity uh, about your client to portray them in a good light. We spend much of our time trying to achieve the opposite result, telling our clients to stay out of the limelight as much as possible, and say as little as possible, preferably nothing. I do not consider that generating publicity about my clients is part of the process. Indeed, I'm hard pressed to recall a single occasion where any positive publicity about my clients uh, through the use of a crisis management expert has been of any benefit at all to my client in the result of the case, and I would suggest nor should it. Um, that's not to say that there is not the place for a crisis management expert. Um, um, over the years, there have been a number of situations where uh, we've received notification for a high-profile client that there is about to be a leak to the media about some salacious comment, a uh, piece of information. And on those occasions, I have retained crisis management experts who are very uh, uh, much of assistance in helping the family and your client um, deal with the media exposure that's about to occur. Um, the general policy, in my view, is that providing there are no criminal charges or uh, pending litigation, um, a statement should be prepared um, um, in which an acknowledgement is made of the allegation if an acknowledgement is appropriate. It will contain a little bit of meal culpa, a little bit of contrition about the uh, effects on the person's family and then ask the media to respect their privacy. Uh, in my experience, that will cause the story to go away quicker than it will if the client ducks and weaves and refuses to speak to the media. But that's a very different situation to a client who's either under investigation for the commission of a criminal offence or has actually been charged. And I think it's difficult to envisage a situation where a person in those circumstances should be engaging a crisis management expert to generate publicity about them. Nor do I think lawyers should speak publicly about their clients for the purpose of generating publicity. I can't recall the last time I heard a lawyer speaking about his or her client uh, where I considered there was any real benefit to the client. Alternatively, there are occasions when you're acting for a high-profile client uh, where one has to consider a press statement um, for the accused. If you don't say something, the press will continue to hound the person and literally camp outside their door until something is said. But I don't think you need a crisis management expert to assist in that process. All it takes is a couple of paragraphs where the person will acknowledge that he or she has been charged with committing a criminal offence um, there'll be an acknowledgement that it's a very difficult time for the accused and his or her family. Um, as the matter is before the courts, it would be inappropriate to say anything further. And lastly, there is the um, normal request that the media uh, respect the privacy of the accused and their family. Um, Leon and I appear to have had very different experiences with the press. Um, after 30 years of dealing with them, I have a basic distrust of them. Uh, I think they're uh, more um, keen to write an interesting article with a salacious headline than actually get the story right. I think the question needs to be posed, what is the benefit of engaging a crisis management expert if a person's been charged with criminal offending? It cannot be to affect the outcome. Juries have shown that they're smarter than that. They apply themselves intellectually to the task that's required of them in accordance with their sworn duty. And whilst they might be swayed by good advocacy, I don't think they're swayed by emotion or prejudice. In my opinion, if someone is charged with committing a criminal offence or involved in uh, large <coughs> litigation, 
there, it's more appropriate for them to weather the storm of the litigation or the criminal charges, and after the completion of the court process, that's the time when perhaps a crisis management expert can be engaged to try and restore what damage has been done, if that is possible. One of the real dangers that I think in engaging a crisis management expert to generate publicity about your client is that often decisions are made about what will be said publicly at a time when you won't know what the evidence is against your client. The brief may not have been served, uh, there may be further evidence to come. The effect of the publicity could be to provide the prosecution with material upon which your client could be cross-examined. On a worst case scenario, um, when you don't know what the evidence is, uh, you may even be creating admissible evidence the prosecution could use against your own client. Um, I, I thought I'd tell one war story about the Essendon Football Club. I'm not talking out of school because it's been in the media. The Essendon Football Club decided early in the AFL Asada investigation last year to engage Ziggy Swakowski um, to prepare a report on the supplements program in season 2012. Um, the club at that stage was um, very much looking for answers, but it announced it to the media that they had commissioned the report and they undertook that they would release at least um, a summary of the report. The report was never going to give the club a clean bill of health. The findings were always going to be adverse. It was simply a matter of how damaging the comments were going to be. It was in Mr Spokowski's report that he coined the phrase, a culture of pharmacological experimentation. That phrase has been trotted out in the media on dozens of occasions. Indeed, it even formed part of the summary of the AFL in the charges against the Essendon Football Club last year when disciplinary action was taken against it. Uh, it is a clear example of um, uh, trying to generate um, some publicity uh, which is detrimental um, to your cause. Um, Indeed, in my opinion, it's been difficult to generate any positive publicity uh, about the Essendon Football Club, notwithstanding attempts to do so, simply because of the way the media has dealt with it. Um, in closing, um, I repeat that my attitude could be considered conservative and old-fashioned. I don't think court cases should be run through the media. I don't think lawyers should uh, comment publicly about their cases as distinct from um, issues. Um, they shouldn't be interviewed by the media on the steps of the court. Our clients are free to do whatever they want after the court case is finished. But uh, in my opinion, while the court case is pending, uh, there is little, if any, room for crisis management experts uh, to be engaged to generate publicity for your client. Thank you. Referred to competing analyses, uh, and uh, I'm really here to say I agree with both of them, uh, <laughs> which uh, makes it both easy and difficult. Difficult because it's a very, very complex, complex issue. Coming from where I did, which was as a traditional uh, criminal defence lawyer, uh, my rule was: do not talk to the press. And my rule still is: do not talk to the press. Uh, to the extent that uh, some people felt that uh, things had to be uttered, uh, uh, I left that responsibility to the solicitors, subject to strict instructions that I was, uh, I had a right of veto over certain uh, utterances and expressions. So from, from, from the old fashioned, good old criminal type cases, you've got someone who's charged with murder, rape, this, that and the other, uh, I entirely agree with Tony Hargraves. Uh, I uh, loathe spin doctors, even though over the years I've come to realise that uh, some of them have some genius about them. Uh, but my immediate response in the case of someone, an individual who's charged with a criminal offence and a serious criminal offence at that, is that if the media has been very, very unkind, as it had been to certain of my clients, you've heard the name Gatto mentioned, uh, the more unkind, the more extreme, the more vilificatory, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the better. Because from a technical point of view, when you're in front of a jury and the actual evidence plays out, you're generally able to play on the basis of, you've heard all this, but now you've heard what the real situation is. And that generally 
tends to operate in, fav in favour of the defence. Uh, that's if you've made any, any headway. Uh, because by the time someone like Gatto had been gone through the press as uh, uh, whatever it is that they've named him, and the jury actually come to hear the facts of the particular case uh, in which he was charged with murder, they say, well, he may be this and he may be that, but good God, I mean, where's the evidence that, that, that he murdered this man w when the case is clear? So to that extent, uh, in those sorts of traditional cases, I'm uh, at one with Tony Hargraves. Uh, Leon's Wire, on the other hand, uh, is really dealing with different kinds of situations which raise very, very complicated issues and very, very complicated problems when you're dealing with a major corporation uh, which has been, let's say, uh, had a, a press campaign against, uh, against it or has been through a press campaign which involved allegations of serious bribery, for example, uh, security, uh, latents of late. Uh, what do you do with latents, a, a listed company? What do you as a lawyer do? Uh, and do you have any obligation to try and uh, put the record straight in some way? Uh, I've developed a, a number of rules uh, that, that pertain to those sorts of situations because they are terribly complex and in some instances they do require handling. Uh, I wouldn't do it myself. I would trust a genius like Leon to uh, devise a strategy, but I would reserve the right to say, no, take this out or take that out. I think that's, that, that might be counterproductive. So there are times when uh, you as lawyers uh, would probably be wise to have some kind of media management uh, uh, approach and policy. I'm assuming, of course, that uh, all of you represent clients who are rich enough to be able to afford spin doctors when the need arises. Uh, uh, that uh, does not always apply, but when it comes to major corporations, they usually do. When it comes to politicians, they usually do. Uh, and some of them are pretty bad, unless the politician is real dumb. Uh, for example, uh, the question that we're asked, uh, or rather that's posed by the, the topic is, how do you salvage your reputation and appear open and contrite while protecting the legal position and privilege? Well, uh, first question that arises is whose reputation are you trying to protect? Are you trying to protect a corporation, for example, or an individual officer of a corporation who's been accused of certain things? Uh, but the second issue, uh, contrite and saving the position, is usually a, a, a preferable one, uh, but it may have other consequences. <clears throat> I'm reminded that uh, Tony Abbott screwed up something shocking on the notion of contrite and preservation of position when uh, the uh, Indonesian phone bugging scandal came out. It seems that he was simply not capable of learning the simple lesson that uh, President Obama uh, came through so clearly with uh, when uh, dealing with uh, Angela Merkel, which was to say, and that's what Tony Abbott, of course, should have said apart from not a part, instead of saying, well, everybody does it, don't they? Uh, his position should have been, look, I'm shocked. <coughs> it didn't happen on my watch. I'll commence an inquiry uh, and I'll make sure it never happens again. Uh, instead of which, he uh, mishandled the situation, despite the fact that he's got, I think, one of the largest armies of spin doctors working for him, so perhaps he doesn't read their recommendations. But as a rule, uh, I. As I say, I, I dislike uh, spin doctors for what they do. Uh, and we are also operating in, in a, a very, very complicated world because uh, the media is not what it used to be. Uh, the media is not the odd newspaper report or the television reporter uh, reporting. Uh, the uh, uh, Bill Shorten matter that Leon Zwire uh, mentioned uh, broke in, in the blogosphere. Uh, as uh, some of you who have read the papers uh, uh, may uh, know. Uh, and the question then becomes, well, how do you deal with the blogosphere? You, you don't start a blog of your, of your, of your own. Uh, do you sue for defamation or don't you? And usually when somebody mentions defamation to me, I say, Oscar Wilde, uh, don't worry about it, don't do it, just wait and see. But 
the uh, world we live in is so complex that there are no simple answers. Uh, but to the question of how do you salvage a reputation, the first issue you want to raise to yourself is, is the reputation salvageable? Or is the taint uh, one that will stick in the sense that no matter what happens, uh, I draw to your attention, for example, the case of uh, uh, Theophanes. You may remember he was accused of rape. He went through committal proceedings. Uh, I defended him, uh, I'm happy to say. Couldn't save his reputation. The fact is we achieved a result which was, statistically speaking, something like you know, a 1%, 2% result when a, a committing magistrate in an allegation of, of a, a sexual assault says, this is just so incredible, out. But that didn't save his reputation. Uh, when, when allegations like that are made, uh, they're unsalvageable other than, as Leon has said, by the kind of dignified denial and, and uh, the, that uh, Bill Shorten made. And he had to do that. You, could, you, you can't let it go because it's an unending kind of situation. That there's no, no definition of finality there and, and the smear in some quarters adheres and stays uh, no matter what the true situation is. So uh, it's a question of uh, horses for courses and it's a question of an analysis uh, of the relevant matters. The, the, you need to ask yourselves as practitioners or as corporate counsel, uh, first question is, who's the client? Is it a corporation, for example? Whose interest am I protecting? Am I protecting the interests of uh, a particular uh, officer of a corporation or the corporation itself? I've just finished a lengthy trial in WA where the CEO of a, a significant listed company was charged with tax fraud. Uh, the outcome was fortunately a good one in the end, but uh, he remained CEO. Normally speaking, of course, what happens with a major listed company, if somebody is charged with a serious criminal offence like tax fraud, uh, they're stood down. Uh, the board of this company voted to keep him going, and fortunately uh, uh, he was vindicated. But so the first question is, whose interest are you looking after? Uh, the second one, before you decide to do anything, is what is the cause in issue? And there are different sorts of causes. There was a, the recent litigation, you might remember, for example, involving uh, a Queensland company, Sunland, which, was, uh, which involved a, a failed Dubai venture where two Australians were incarcerated in Dubai for a long, long time. But there are also two other Australians against whom potential extradition uh, was a matter to be considered and of course that was uh, as good as death itself, uh, uh, any, anything of the kind. The regulations for the extradition treaty with the UAE had not been promulgated and so, uh, but, but they were imminently to be so in the Senate uh, and once uh, uh, put through the treaty would have had effect and we would have been in peril, my client, at any event. Uh, so the question is what's to be done? That was a situation in which spin doctors were needed and necessary, not so much to try and do anything about the civil litigation that uh, uh, was uh, at that stage imminent, but to try and deal with, with uh, the possibility of extradition to the UAE. Spin doctors were employed. Lobbyists were employed. The, 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 there was an effort to try and get a, a majority of the Senate to reject these uh, regulations because they for example, did not confer on Australian citizens the sort of protection that the English treaty conferred. The Americans never entered an extradition treaty with the UAR because they realised that they would be selling their citizens out, uh, so they didn't enter into one. Uh, and so sometimes, uh, as a lawyer, uh, that sort of campaign is uh, on the cards. And if it is, then, then of course spin doctoring and, and PR is essential. But you need to ask yourself, what is the cause? Uh, and at what stage of the matter are we? Are we at the stage of an investigation? Are we at the stage of an impending royal commission? Are we at the stage of contemplating suing? Are we at the stage of contemplating being sued? Has action commenced, uh, etc.? The, the, this will usually give you the right answer about what to do, because once action has commenced, of course, uh, 
really quite apart from contempt of court problems or issues that might arise, the best outcome is silence. Uh, a, a dignified denial and, and, and an assertion that the matter of subjudi is subjudice, uh, whether or not it's subjudice in the courts or, or is the subject of a Royal Commission investigation. Third question you always ask yourself is, do I know about the enough about the issue, uh, issues that are likely to determine the outcome of the cause, whatever the cause is? And if you don't, then the safest course is to do nothing. Fourth question is, is the problem strictly a legal problem or is it a political problem? Uh, as you uh, appreciate, the, uh, from what I've said about the UAE Treaty, that was a political problem but had uh, possible legal ramifications afterwards. Uh, for Bill Shorten, it's a, it was a political problem and is a political problem still until the matter dies the death it deserves to die. Uh, the fifth uh, uh, assessment is what is already out there, out and about, and is it decisively rebuttable in a way that will not give oxygen to uh, the debate? And I'm not just talking about newspapers, I'm talking about the blogosphere, I'm talking about uh, mainstream media, television, uh, newspapers. The main, the main thing about journalism and, and television is uh, it, it feeds off itself and auto-generates. And the more you contribute to the auto-generation of a story, uh, the worse you do for your client. Because uh, as a journalist told me last week, I spent a bit of time with him uh, just discussing uh, dealing with the press. He said there are only two kinds of journalists, those that you know and those who will screw you over. Uh, he didn't use the word screw, he used another one. Uh, but uh, the situation is, that so far as dealing, dealings with the, the media are concerned, the safest course is uh, not to deal with the media unless you know the journalist, you know the journalist to be honourable. And if you're dealing with that person, you deal with that person on the basis that your interest is that there be a proper backgrounding so that the person, the, the reporter, uh, the TV journalist, that they know what the real issues are. Uh, because they're not generally dishonest, they just don't uh, usually get exposed to the real issues. The next uh, question you ask yourself is should anything be said at all? And I adhere to the principle that uh, silence is golden, but there are distinctions to be made between civil, criminal, quasi-criminal types of issues and depending on who the uh, uh, victim uh, is of the story that is. And the next question, uh, that you ask is, is what I'm doing achievable? Is what I'm trying to do achievable? The usual answer is no. And, and so uh, it's usually a question of saying, well, uh, unless I absolutely have to do this, uh, I won't. Uh, will anything which is put out to the public come back to bite you? That's the next question. And, and that is a very, very important question because a lot of people don't understand the impact of the Uniform Evidence Act. They don't understand the notion of admissions through an authorised agent, admissions or false denials that can come back and bite you. Uh, and, and so as a matter of caution, the question is always, uh, for as far into the future as I can foresee, can, this, can whatever my client says or whatever I say on the client's behalf, can that come back and bite the client? Uh, and uh, the next question is, uh, have I appreciated the possible end game of whatever process is in place? The tenth and ultimate question, of course, is one of the most important and, and should be second nature to you. And the question is, is it ethical? Uh, and the uh, bar has rules of conduct in relation to dealing uh, with the media that uh, do, certainly do not preclude you from properly backgrounding someone so that they have a proper appreciation uh, of the client's position. Uh, there's nothing wrong with making sure that th the solicitor usually who does the backgrounding uh, is apprised of sufficient material. So once you've answered all those questions, by and large the answer is going to be it's not going to do me any good to deal 
with the media and to try to win the case in the press. Cases do not get won in the press. Certainly not in crime, as I say, the advantage is sometimes the other way, when your client is extremely vilified. On the other hand, uh, in civil matters, I don't believe the judges are won over by what they read in the newspapers. Of course they read the newspapers, but uh, uh, I don't think cases are won there. Uh, that's all I've got to say about uh, uh, public uh, relations. Uh, I'm sure Julian will speak about other matters of the far greater significance where you have to take a stand and you must take a stand because of hysterical uh, moral panics and appalling legislation that's foisted on us that is increasing our prison population unnecessarily, that is curtailing civil liberties. <laughs> In those sorts of spheres, lawyers have a duty to speak out because monstrous things are being done in our name. Thank you. We were all invited to speak for five minutes. Um, that's a challenge that I will try and rise to and I'm very grateful to Robert for stopping when I still had two minutes to go. Um, can I say I can make the first bit of this short. I'm with Tony, I disagree with Leon, but I admire what Leon does in public advocacy outside litigation. The real problem I see with, uh, um, I don't like the idea of cases being run in the media. Whether it's by solicitors, and certainly if it's by barristers, cases should not be run in the media. Solicitors have more latitude, but I think it's uh, a very poor thing for barristers to be discussing publicly the, the merits of the cases that they're running at the time. Um, now, there's a different point, and, and Robert touched on this, the idea of backgrounding the press off the record, I think makes perfect sense because for most, uh, for most um, journalists sitting in court and listening to us fogging on is not very enlightening, and it's useful for them to be able to understand what the case is actually about. And quite frankly, if you read some reports in some newspapers about some cases, you'd be forgiven if you could not understand what the case was about. Backgrounding, I think, can serve a very useful purpose, but it need, if it's by a barrister, it must be off the record, and if it's by a solicitor, uh, I would prefer that it was off the record. I don't like cases being run in the media. Now, I want to touch on a different subject that no one has yet talked about, and that is, um, barristers talking to the media more generally, not talking about cases they're in, uh, but more generally. Now, the most obvious observation is that it's not part of our culture. Um, I departed from that conventional view in 2002 and subsequently um, because I was distressed about what was being done in Australia to asylum seekers. Um, I suffered considerably from the fact of having um, departed from the conventional position. And the issue was brought into focus for me um, at a very glittering social function when the wife of an extremely senior colleague came up to me and um, said, do you think it appropriate that a member of the bar should speak publicly about these things? And in what I regard as a flash of insight, I said, do you think it appropriate to know these things and remain silent. And that pretty much captured for me the reason that I was willing to depart from the convention and speak to the press uh, about matters completely remote from any litigation that I was involved in. Um, and my answer to that woman seemed to me to resolve the difficulty that I'd had. And it certainly made up for a great deal of the cold shoulders that I'd suffered in the years that I was talking to the press about these things. Uh, since I've only used four minutes so far, I want to tell you something which I think is entertaining, but I will admit it is off the point, Your Honour, and it is uh, irrelevant. <laughs> By virtue, one of, the, one of the many causes of discomfort when a barrister takes a public stand on an issue which is unpopular is that you get hate mail. And I used to get lots of hate mail mostly by email, and I decided that these were people who self-evidently did not agree with my position and that they ought to be persuaded to see things differently. And so I resolved to answer all the hate mail. Probably a stupid position to have adopted, but I hadn't done the arithmetic. Anyway, so I would sit up every night and answer all these emails, and curiously, 
despite the fact that most of the hate mail was written in very explicit terms and extreme rudeness, challenging my, my sincerity, my honesty, my integrity, uh, my parentage, the whole thing, um, when I replied to them, they would mostly reply, and typically the replies would be along the lines of, um, well, I didn't expect to hear from you, and um, that's all very well, but what about this and that? And then I'd give them some more facts, and about half of them ended up writing back saying in substance that they agreed with me. I thought that was quite good. Um, so just a different domain of advocacy, I suppose. The hate mail stopped more or less in about 2006 when the issue went away. But the best hate mail I ever got came to me in 2007. Um, I was over in Perth doing something and I saw something come up on the screen and I knew it was hate mail. And it said, and I quote, Dear fuckwit, what, <laughs> that was a giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you think being a QC means that anyone is interested in your opinions, why don't you fuck off and die? <laughs> now, um, the difficulty I had was that unlike all of the other hate mail, I couldn't engage with it intellectually <laughs> for two reasons. First, the first proposition I thought was self-evidently true, mm -hmm. unless the writer was a judge, which I thought was not likely. Um, and the rest of it simply didn't provide any foothold for an intellectual response. And so I borrowed a line which Bill Leake once told me, and I wrote back saying, Dear so-and-so, thank you for your email. The offer of your sister is interesting. Please send photographs. <laughs> <laughs> I love that moment. <laughs> anyway, uh, to my surprise, he wrote back. <laughs> And he said, fair enough, I suppose I was a bit over the top. So I thought, well, there's a rational mind there after all. I, I wrote back saying, well, that's OK, I don't mind, but I'm interested that you wrote just now. I've been talking about this for quite a while. Did it all get too much or did you just stumble on it? And he wrote back saying, um, I should come clean. I'd had a huge night out. I was arguing with a bloke I couldn't stand. We were arguing about asylum seekers. I suppose I should have written to him. For some reason, I wrote to you. Actually, I think you're doing quite a good job, so please ignore me. <laughs> and that, may I say, is probably the most successful form of public advocacy I've ever been, been involved in. Thank you. Um, I think we've got a few minutes, according to our chairman, for a few questions. Do we have any from the floor? Fantastic. Please. You can send it by email if you want. <laughs> it's a comment and perhaps a question about the issue of uh, the use of spin doctors. Um, the, the, this is an issue, I think, fundamentally about the way public debate takes place and the, uh, the professionalism in relation to public debate. And uh, the, the way the question is framed PR is, I think, not the way those concerned with communication would quite see it. It's, uh, it's an issue of, if there is public debate, how should that public debate take place in the best possible way? In some circumstances, I can see it's, of course, it's relevant what the implications of that public debate might be for litigation. But, but broadly, I think the issue is one of professionalism in communication, and I share the view that was expressed by Robert Richter, which is that some people in this area are geniuses at, at framing and communicating, and communicating clearly. Thank you. Can I respond to that by saying, I think Leon is a good example of someone who knows how to frame the issues, <laughs> and as long as he does it outside the context of litigation, I don't have a problem with it at all. It's, it's running cases through the press that I have a problem with. Do you want to respond, Leon? Yeah, I, I'm not advocating ever to run cases through the press. What I'm saying is when you have issues of reputation, um, such as you know, corporations being criticised, a CEO being maligned on, on the blogosphere, which we see more and more, I think it's critical for us to be seen to be backgrounding journalists, thinking about strategies to deal with it. But I don't believe in running court cases in the, in, in the media. Robert, do you have a comment? I've never seen him run a case through the media, but I've seen him background pretty professionally <laughs> and successfully. Thank you. Uh, any more <coughs> questions? 
I think we've got a little bit more time, please. Uh, this one for Mr Burnside. I think I was watching a, a, um, a pharmaceuticals case in which you were acting for the plaintiffs. And as I recall it, uh, the pharmaceutical company had spin doctors at the back of the court um, handing out briefings and, uh, and um, uh, information to the journalists in an attempt to uh, win, win the war. And then that seemed to become a story in itself. I was just running, given you were involved in that case, if you had any observations about that tactic by the defendant. Um, th thank you for the question. If, I, if I'm right in remembering it, uh, that was the Viox litigation and the spin doctors at the back of the court were for the uh, manufacturer. Um, so they were, the def they were the respondents. And they, they were eagerly running around handing journalists at the end of every day, handing them a series of dot points, identifying what they regarded as the key points of the day. Um, predictably, they tended to be rather in favour of Merck rather than the applicant. But they went a step too far when they chased one journalist into the ladies' toilets in order to persuade her to see things their way. And that led her to writing a big piece, uh, uh, two double-page spread a couple of weekends later. And those uh, PR people disappeared from the court very rapidly after that. Do we have any more questions? Um, well, on behalf of all of us, can I um, take this opportunity to thank our speakers? I did think there might be a few more jokes about Essendon, a few other stories, um, but certainly looking at the breadth of what was discussed and how constrained people were about it, it's obviously a very, very unusual and difficult topic, and one which I think Robert Richter succinctly put that there are two different points of view, and it's very hard at times that they, they do have to be balanced. Um, there is one question I do want to ask, if I may. Um, in circumstances where there is an issue, and regardless of how, um, how um, constrained the parties and indeed how constrained the lawyers are, um, it's going to go in the press regardless. And it might be a, about a football team, it might be about a particular murder. At what stage do you simply remain silent and let the press roll? And at what stage do you decide you've got to say something or try and at least put a, a version of events. And one of the issues might be, for instance, the South African case recently, how much press was in that, actually seeing people in court, seeing the prosecutor lambast someone in the witness box in a way that we wouldn't be able to get away with. And the um, amazing astonishment of people when they watch that media, then they see the result. So at what stage do you actually remain silent or what's the trigger? Perhaps I could ask Tony Hargraves. I think when it's wrong, and then um, all I will do, and I have done it, is I will ring up the journalist and I will say that is factually incorrect, and uh, here are the correct circumstances of it, that, and uh, it's, it's incumbent upon you to correct it in tomorrow's paper. Well, be careful also you're not generating more adverse publicity for those yes. who've missed it today, they see it tomorrow, a bit like a defamation thing, but generally speaking, that's about the limit. I, I really, really talk to them, really engage with them. Leon? Well, um, my experience is in most issues like that, the media will come to you in advance of the publication. And so from my perspective, which is very different from Tony's, I would say you need to engage before, to shape it before the publication, and not wait until after the publication to correct it. So I am proactive in, the, in that respect. That is, if there's an inquiry, deal with it ahead of time, frame the issue correctly. If you need to, threaten. If you need to use defamation, use defamation work with it and get, get a better result. And, and again, um, going back to, to one example that we talked of, when the story broke about Bill Shorten, it, it broke in the mainstream media, in the Australian, but it broke without Bill Shorten ever being named. It never was named. It said a senior Labor figure um, and, and it was important. It would have done us no good had it been the day after that he'd been named to complain that, that he ought not to have been. Um, I, I, it depends on what you mean by talking to the media there. I, I mean, if you, if, you, if you background them, if 
the solicitor's background and on what the case is actually about, the prospect of mistaken reporting is much reduced. Mm. You know, I, th I think lawyers <coughs> have an exaggerated opinion of, of how easy it is to understand what's going on in court. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I feel great sympathy for journalists who sit in a court and try and understand what the hell is going on. Now, uh, that's why I don't have a problem with the idea of uh, lawyers um, giving background information off the record to journalists to ensure that the reporting is accurate. I mean, they try to be accurate, I think. So if you do that properly and um, sensibly, you should never get the problem that you describe. Uh, Will Horton, when you were a, or form, in your former life, you were a director of uh, a North Melbourne Football Club, as it may have been called then. Um, still is. Still is. And um, in that situation, when, for instance, Wayne Carey's um, issues blew up, um, how was that handled, or was there, a, was there a way in which you handled it that you might handle it differently now? Look, I, I wasn't there when the Wayne Carey issue blew up, thank God. But um, one of the dangers uh, that one has in dealing with the media is repercussions judicially. And I think the best example of that is when I was appearing for Andrew Bolt in a defamation case some years ago, and he managed to persuade a jury that what he'd said about the deputy chief magistrate uh, being a soft cock uh, was reasonable in all the circumstances. So in other words, he had succeeded in front of a jury on one of his defences, which meant he won the case at that stage. My opponent very quickly persuaded the trial judge to reserve uh, for another day argument as to why that verdict should be taken from the jury. And my opponent was later successful in removing that verdict from the jury. But in the course of that proceeding, my client went out into a dark Melbourne evening and gave um, a doorstop interview to the assembled media where he said, I'm very pleased, words to the effect that I'm very pleased that the jury has upheld my right to free speech, I think were his words. Now later, when the judge overturned the verdict, the judge went on to consider the question of damages and the judge was very critical of the doorstop interview that had been given by my client. So, not only did he award the plaintiff substantial damages, he added to that award of damages an award of exemplary damages in order to punish the defendant in part for that doorstop interview. Now, that hurt. Um, the Court of Appeal later reversed that part of the damages, but one really has to be very careful during the course of a court case, um, uh, particularly when it hasn't finished, as to what you, want your, what you allow your client uh, to say to the media on the record. Um, but as far as damage control con is concerned at football clubs, I can't think of what the club could have done in the Wayne Carey incident, but you might re recall that one of our players earlier this year was charged with a rape that went back to when the complainant was 15 years old and when the accused was 16 years old. Now that occurred some six years before he even arrived at the club and the position of the club was that first of all, it would support the player and not suspend him. Uh, secondly, it would allow the player and his management to be responsible for the defence of those charges and the committal is coming up in two months' time. Um, and thirdly, um, it, it prepared a response um, to possible media questions that might result from charges being laid. In, in the event, the media didn't pursue many questions about that, but the moral of the story is be ready. Uh, be ready for uh, the questions to come and have a measured and reasonable response. Do we have any further uh, comments in relation to that? Uh, do we have any other questions? Um, can I just indicate um, how grateful we are to our speakers um, and the level of experience they have in relation to these issues is um, Second to none. Uh, so, could you please thank them in the usual way? I'll just start. <laughs> While the attorney is just about to arrive, he's been rather busy lately, so I think he um, will be here any minute. In the meantime, can I just um, indicate that today was a great uh, celebration of the collaboration that we have in our profession. We started the day being challenged by our two Chief Justices to be more cost effective 
and more efficient in dispute resolution. Indeed, Chippis has also made the comment, people will pay for skill, but they won't pay for process. We were then told how to be more cost efficient by Alan Myers and others, including Justice, Ju uh, Justice Judd, in looking at matters involving discovery, witness statements and pleadings, or as Myers put it, the lack thereof. Chris Fox from Mallison's and Rachel Binney gave, also gave us interpretation from their point of view as how we can move forward. Our overarching obligations were then reinforced and examined by Michael Wheelahan and Justice Forrest and the, and the panel. And then for some business development advice, international arbitration was discussed and the great opportunities that are available to this profession, particularly in Victoria, now that we have our own International Commercial Arbitration Centre opened by the attorney recently. Peter Megan spoke about the great opportunities in Singapore and the reasons why he'd flown there on that basis for business development and it was a hub we should be looking forward to. Class actions in the largest common law case in recent history was then discussed. Not only did we have the solicitors and barristers involved in that case, we also were privileged to have the judge himself to give us his reflections and the lessons that can be learnt from such an extraordinary case. The idea that part of that case was, or at least most of it, I think, if not all of it, um, was without trolleys, theoretically without folders, and was almost paperless, was an amazing example of what can be achieved and a great reflection upon the judge himself and, of course, the court. And you recall being told that, in fact, when they started that case, they had no court. And thanks to the attorney, they actually had a special built mega court, which is one of our great prides in Victoria. So much so that I think a few Royal Commissions have been trying to use it recently, but they haven't been able to get their hands on it. It's great, been a great privilege um, to have our Chief Justices and our State Attorney, who will address us in a moment. We were perhaps given the best example this afternoon of the talents and breadth we have in our profession by the speakers we had in our last session. Our collaboration collided with public relations, with Essendon, Bill Shorten, Pratt, Gabbo, Spin Doctors, and the conflicting views and marvellous refl reflections. It's a new world and the challenges are great, but the collaboration, the value of the collaboration in our profession is, I suggest, even greater. It's been a great privilege for all of us, both the Chief Justices and all those judges that appeared um, before you, as well as our speakers, and to have such fine speakers from the Supreme Court and the Federal Court was a great honour for all of us. Together with that, I also thank the solicitors and barristers that have appeared and given their time. Can I now call upon the Attorney General, Robert Clark, to give us a closing address? Thank you very much, Will. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to have been asked to say a few words in closing this conference, and I want to begin by uh, congratulating everybody who has helped make this conference possible. Uh, Will, your leadership and enthusiasm, I think, has been uh, infectious uh, and inspiring, and uh, as well as congratulating you and uh, the Bar Council, can I also congratulate the Law Institute and uh, President Jeff Boyer and uh, Nerida Wallace, the new CEO, and everybody else who's come together to make this conference possible. Uh, Will, in your remarks just then, you touched uh, on the issue of uh, collaboration, and I think the words uh, collaboration and innovation are perhaps uh, the watchwords, not only for this conference, but for some of the themes of the approach to the law that are developing more generally uh, in Victoria over recent years. And they are, of course, both very uh, important themes. We're seeing uh, improvements and in uh, collaboration and cooperation at many different levels uh, across our legal system. I suppose one example is the recent establishment of Court Services Victoria, the administrative body that uh, uh, now provides the administrative uh, and logistical support to all of our courts under a courts council of which each of the heads of jurisdiction is a member. And we're certainly seeing in relation to the different courts uh, 
uh, a, a growing opportunities for uh, cooperation and collaboration and seeing very fruitful results coming from that in terms of innovations that have been implemented across different jurisdictions, uh, collaboration on issues such as uh, court security, IT, properties management, uh, and uh, looking for opportunities uh, to share facilities, make better use of facilities, and I think flowing through from that, looking more broadly at the ways in which uh, the different jurisdictions interact and the way matters may move from one jurisdiction uh, to another. We're also seeing growing collaboration with the uh, impending establishment of the uniform uh, uh, legal services uh, regime between Victoria and uh, New South Wales. Uh, we've seen the announcement to, today of the new members of the, uh, of the council that will preside over that. Uh, certainly uh, I and my New South Wales uh, counterpart Brad Hazard are doing our best to inspire and uh, encourage other jurisdictions to join in the uh, uniform regime. Now, we're emphasising to smaller jurisdictions that it's a, a federalist scheme, it's not a centralist scheme. And we are still very hopeful that other jurisdictions will, over time, uh, join in the uniform scheme so that we can end up with a truly national integrated legal profession. And I certainly want to uh, thank and pay uh, tribute to the work uh, both of the Victorian Bar and the Victorian Law Institute in seeking to uh, inspire and encourage other jurisdictions, their counterparts in other jurisdictions, to take part in that uh, uh, uniform scheme. So there has been a lot happening in terms of collaboration. There's also been a lot happening in terms of innovation. Uh, the law is operating in a uh, rapidly changing, broader commercial environment, uh, uh, internationally uh, financial and uh, legal and economic, uh, as well as geopolitical uh, challenges, certainly a, uh, a number of pressure points on the profession and on legal practice, and it's important that uh, everybody involved in providing legal uh, services and upholding the, uh, the rule of law and uh, uh, the operation of our courts looks continuously at ways to do things uh, more effectively, uh, differently, uh, and uh, a smarter way, taking advantage of, of new technologies. And again, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the terrific leadership in that regard that is being provided by all of our different heads of jurisdiction, ranging from the, uh, uh, the presiding over the Courts Council by uh, Her Honour the Chief Justice through to uh, some of the uh, opportunities for uh, video appearances in the Magistrates' Court through to some of the uh, use of new uh, high technology ways of uh, recording and presenting evidence that were tested out in the, uh, the new mega trials uh, courtroom with the bushfire litigation that uh, Will referred to a few moments ago. So this conference uh, and some of the topics that you've uh, considered today uh, comes at a very uh, timely moment and hopefully this uh, uh, historical collaboration of uh, uh, the, the judiciary and the two arms of the uh, profession and many others to make this conference uh, possible is a, a first that uh, is followed by many other similar uh, uh, conferences. And uh, I thought uh, in uh, concluding the, the, the conference, which coincides with the uh, conclusion of the 57th uh, Victorian Parliament, the last sittings that took place yesterday, I might just briefly touch on uh, some of the uh, items coming out of uh, the Victorian Parliament that uh, have uh, impacted and will continue to impact on your work hopefully in a positive way and in a positive way for the benefit uh, of the community. And uh, just uh, this last sitting week, uh, uh, five particular pieces of legislation uh, related to my portfolio have gone through uh, the parliament, which will uh, uh, come into operation over coming months. Uh, we've had uh, far-reaching reform to sexual uh, offences, uh, changing the uh, definition of the fault element, hopefully simplifying the specification of those offences that for um, uh, practitioners involved in the criminal jurisdiction uh, will uh, find of benefit. We've had uh, passage of legislation to introduce uh, an unexplained wealth scheme and an asset uh, uh, seizure uh, regime in Victoria, which again hopefully will be of assistance in relation to uh, pursuing large-scale commercial drug traffickers uh, uh, and others. We've passed legislation in relation to family violence matters, including providing for 24-7 uh, issue of uh, uh, police safety notices. 
Uh, we've passed legislation relating to the expungement of historical homosexual offences, which hopefully will uh, enable a number of people who've lived under uh, the consequences of those uh, convictions to be uh, free of those consequences uh, for the future and have the, their records expunged. And uh, last but certainly not least, at about uh, uh, 30 seconds before closing time in the Legislative Assembly yesterday, the Assembly passed the uh, uh, Justice Legislation Amendment uh, Succession and Surrogacy uh, Bill, which will give effect to uh, reforms to particularly uh, testators' family uh, uh, maintenance provisions, to, uh, family provisions, uh, and also uh, rectify some anomalies in relation to assisted reproductive uh, uh, treatment uh, burst by uh, surrogacy. So there, just in the last week, there's been uh, significant reform going through the parliament, and of course that follows on from a wide range of other uh, reforms that have uh, gone through uh, the current parliament, as well as uh, the support that the government's been pleased to give to measures such as the Commercial Arbitration and Mediation Centre, which I know were touched on earlier today. So the legislative uh, regime is changing uh, rapidly, as, is, uh, as are so many other aspects of the external environment. So uh, this conference, as I said, comes at a particularly uh, timely moment and hopefully the matters that you've covered uh, today that will be of assistance to your practice going uh, forward. I heard, uh, Will, you make some observations about the intersection between the public relations and the law in the closing uh, uh, panel. It did uh, strike me that uh, uh, the intersection between the politics and the law is also becoming uh, particularly uh, focused at, uh, at time and much of the uh, effort of practitioners or some of the effort of practitioners in relation to litigation is directed uh, and the practice more broadly is directed to uh, changes to the law and to political events as much as to uh, uh, the black letter law. So no doubt that will be continue to be a growing challenge uh, and uh, opportunity. But uh, uh, can I conclude where I began by expressing uh, my congratulations to everybody who's made this conference uh, Possible. It is a groundbreaking conference. I do hope it uh, uh, sets the path for the future, and it's my uh, pleasure to uh, officially bring this uh, conference to a conclusion. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Attorney. Um, the Attorney has been incredibly busy lately. Um, as of a month ago, he had passed, put up to Parliament over 80 bills, of which over 66 had passed, obviously more now, and 13 were currently before the parliament. Um, he's been responsible and a great supporter of our Uniform Legal Profession Scheme, which New South Wales and Victoria are currently the leaders in, um, and we're hoping that Queensland might jump on board very soon. Certainly the Commonwealth Attorney seems to indicate that is a good possibility. Court Services of Victoria was introduced very recently, and it's been a great thing for Victoria, and I think the courts have very much supported that and celebrated it. Um, the Commercial Arbitration and Mediation Centre would not have happened had, had it not been for the attorney's um, vision and his determination that we would become intellectually, internationally competitive. Um, the mega trials courtroom we've already discussed, um, I think everybody would recognise the attorney is doing the best he can with legal aid. It's obviously a, a, an issue. Unfortunately for the profession, we're going to have more and more unrepresented litigants, not less. Um, there will be a greater impact upon our profession to step up to the mark uh, with no great expectation of further funding, at least in the short term. And our courts, if we want to get on in either commercial or criminal trials, we are going to have to um, make greater sacrifices. There are ones already being made to a great degree. Um, can I thank the attorney very much? He has been a great supporter of the Victorian Bar and the LIV. He's been a great supporter of our profession. Um, and it's very apt that he is actually closing this conference today on our behalf. So, Tony, thank you very much. <laughs> Can I just also very quickly thank the people who put this together? Jeff Bayer, unfortunately, because of family reasons, couldn't be here for the, um, this afternoon, but um, he and I both wanted to thank um, Stephen Hare and Michael Brett Young, the two CEOs, with a new CEO. Uh, Narada Wallace, who was the new and first ever female CEO of the um, Law Institute of Victoria, for their leadership. Jacqueline Stone of our bar and Joe Kerr for the program development. And Megan Lidlin and her team from the LIV and Sally Bodman and Courtney Bow uh, for making this event possible. So would you please join me in thanking them all very much. Um, 
We certainly hope this will be an annual event. It's great to have an all of profession event. And can I leave you with this thought? Brief well and brief early. Thank you very much. Okay.